Hello all and welcome to this bonus episode on the Pod Syndicate feed. Now, uh, the followers of the show will know already that we are big fans of the Star Trek franchise and that we are uh, very happy with CBS All Access's uh, second foray into the franchise with Star Trek Picard. Uh, not only did we have the return of a uh, beloved character at a time when I think we can all agree the world really needed him, um, we were also introduced to numerous new characters who are already cementing themselves uh, as iconic in their own rights. Now, uh, a real breakout character is that of the childlike but deadly Romulan Elnor, uh, brought to life by the talented Australian actor Evan uh, Evagoro, um, who I'm happy to welcome to the show. So thanks so much for your time, Evan. Thanks for having me. How are you? Um, you good? I'm good. I'm good. We were just talking a little bit off... off um, off record that uh, it's very rare that we actually have anybody on the show who were not Skyping from LA. So it's really nice to be in somewhat of a similar time zone. So you were saying you're, you're, you're there in Australia with, uh, with the family sort of enjoying being emancipated from the lockdown. Yeah. It, to begin with, it was, you know, like a bit harsh, a bit uh, unusual, you know, something I hadn't experienced before, but I've kind of began to view the lockdown that we were in as kind of a blessing I mean, otherwise I would have been, like you said, over in LA, probably, you know, filming season two. Um, so this is just pretty much an opportunity to spend as much time as possible with friends and family while I can. So it's been, it's been a blessing in disguise, I'd say. What was it? Um, I'm wondering, I don't want to jump over the place too much, but I mean, I'm just thinking the timing of, 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 of the lockdown. I mean, was, was it, was it deflating for you? And obviously you've had this, this initial sort of like flourish of success on the back of Picard. Do you feel that you've, has it impacted your being able to enjoy it? I mean, obviously accessibility to things like conventions and premieres and getting out there. How, how's that felt? I mean, in terms of meeting the fans, it has been a bit different. We tried uh, a, a whole virtual meet and greet. Uh, so it was interesting to be able to meet fans you know, even though it was face to face, it was across the screen, so it is a little bit different. I did experience my first uh, con right before the lockdown, so I was able to meet the fans. You know, kind of gauge their opinion of the show and their thoughts on the characters and everything, because the fans really are the the whole reason why we do the show. Um, you know, if there were no fans, we wouldn't. There would be no Star Trek Picard. There'd be no Star Trek at all. And it's you know great that we've got such a loyal fan base, but. With the lockdown, I'd say it's actually given me a better perspective of things because after uh, season one premiered, we were about to jump right into season two um, filming for Star Trek. And I don't think I would have had any time to really, you know, sit back and evaluate the kind of whirlwind time that my life has been in the past, you know, two years uh, filming this show. So it's uh, like I said, again, it, it, it is really a blessing in disguise. and it's given me more time to actually like look back on the work that I've done in the show and, you know, just, just get gauge everyone's opinion on it as well as my own. So I think it's actually been, you know, very helpful and beneficial. And I suppose also you've got, I mean, I've spoke to people from d different eras of a Star Trek franchise. And one of the things that they often talk about is that really it's, it's two jobs, you know, you've got the work, you've got the, the, the performing, and then you've got all of the other things that, that, that go with that. Um, and I'm just wondering from a, from a sort of cast bonding perspective, obviously there was this period after the filming where you were going out and you were doing these promotional activities. Um, was that sort of part of the bonding experience or were you guys already really tight by the time that you'd done it? How, from a relationships perspective, how was that period after filming when you were actually able to go out and talk and presumably spend time together doing that? Uh, I think you hit the nail on the head. We were able to come together like more as a group, the, the more we, you know, hung outside, hung out outside of work, Comic-Con, uh, you know, like really helped cement kind of our relationship with each other and you know like such a great dynamic uh the motley crew it's what we still call ourselves uh, yeah i'd say the the first time we all hung out like all of us together as a group because Issa and harry were obviously filming um away from us like uh the shooting schedules were a bit different and uh obviously they didn't we didn't we don't meet their character elnor doesn't meet their characters until later in the show but i'd say san diego comic-con was the first time we all really got to, to hang out together and, and bond together as a group. And it's just kind of moved from strength to strength from there. Um, yeah, we've got like a really, really good group of people. And I think I'm really lucky to have landed a job with such wonderful people, you know, and given that it's only the second, the second role I've ever done. And it's the first big role I've ever done in, in 
television or or in in movies. Well, I mean, you mentioned that obviously you're very a very um, a, a formative stage in your career, and I was just wondering if you could just tell us a little bit about your your path to acting. I mean, I, I I understand that you grew up with a very keen interest and abilities in in sport. Uh, was that a career path for you at one point? Was that something that you a road you were thinking of taking? Uh, it was either that or I think a PE teacher at one point. I was trying to think of uh, the, the, a way to do the most work with the most days off. And I was like, oh, the, you know, like a primary school teacher would be would be pretty easy. But, um, I, yeah, like sport was all, was and always will be such a big part of my life. I, I'm, I'm a big ag- advocate for physical activity, like no matter what it is, even if it's just like morning stretches, you know, 15 minutes a day. I, I think it's a good way to help set your mind. and when I do it in the morning, you know, it, it helps, you know, clear a path of, of exactly what I've got to do. And it helps me tackle, you know, all the tasks that I've set out for the day, but yeah, it was for a period of time, you know, it's something that we were, were talking about, but as soon as high school ended, I kind of went on a little bit of a, this like self-discovery trip to Europe. I just wanted to experience the world and, you know, see how other people like live their lives. And after that trip, I was I was kind of left thinking, you know, what was it that I really wanted to do? And film and TV throughout my life has been something that, you know, has played such a large pivotal role. I was the kid who, um, when DVDs first came out, would go to the behind the scenes and watch all of the extras and all of the commentary and, you know, every, every single aspect of it, not just the acting, but, you know, listening to how the props are made from Harry Potter and finding out that the food that they serve in the great hall isn't actually food stuff like that would just blow my mind there's like a kind of magic to film and television i think that really attracted me to it and made me realize that that was my calling were there any particular uh films or performances or uh actors or franchises that were you mentioned harry potter that were formative in that was there was there anything that kind of lit the spark for you i'd have to say every this is such a broad thing but literally Literally everything and everything fantasy uh, attracted me, attracts me to it. I mean, I I'm, I was trying to think the other day, like out of Star Trek and Star Wars, which one, you know, uh, was the most influential. And I just sat there. <laughs> be thinking, very careful how you answer yeah, this I, question. <laughs> I, I just have to be very careful. But they both they both had such an impact on me. It's hard to sure. to split to split the two. And it's the same with things like Lord of the Rings. Um, mm. I was fortunate enough to meet uh, Sir Ian McKellen. Wow. at the start of the year and I was just absolutely starstruck uh yeah. when I met him and luckily you know I, I played it cool I didn't want to bombard him with a bunch of you know like facts or you know kind of like geek out with him I wanted to you know kind of act act a bit like suave act a bit cool so he was like a real lovely person but yeah and everything fantasy and sci-fi I really loved the old Batman movies growing up um the Tim Burton ones and then the is it Joel Schumacher the one with uh I've forgotten his name now. Not not the Clooney Batman, the, uh, the previous one. Michael Keaton or Val Kilmer? Keaton and Val Kilmer. Those are those are the t- my two favorite ones. Although I do have to give credit to Arnold Schwarzenegger as uh, Mr. Freeze because those are some really good cheesy one-liners that are. Oh like, yeah, he's he's at eleven right there. Yeah, isn't he? exactly. Mean, uh... He'd have he'd have been a great Shatner era Star Trek villain, you know. He he uh, he he takes the brakes off, uh, Arnie yeah. does. And you mentioned Lord of the Rings as well. I mean, gosh, you want to talk behind the scenes bonus features on DVDs? That's the uh, the kind of the holy book of yeah. uh, of, of that in many ways. And um, I only watch the extendeds now with Lord of the Rings. I feel like it's the only thing that gives it justice. I can't watch the theatrical shortened versions. I'm like, I need more more you know yeah it does you get that kind of missing limb syndrome when you watch yeah. those uh those shorter ones uh i mean you mentioned as well a little bit about sort of the importance of you know e- exercise and you know how good that is for the, the, the spirit and the soul i'm just wondering um did did that help you did the physicality of what you've done in the past help you with the character of elnor at all well when it came to stunts uh I was able to volunteer myself and offer my services a bit more. Obviously, I'm not, uh, you know, uh, by any means a professional stuntman, fighter or anything like that, but they were able to train me a bit easier uh, and I was able to do a lot more things and I was willing to do a lot more things. Um, There were a few stunts that didn't end up quite making the uh, cut. Like we, I came into rehearsals uh, one day and 
just so you know, it's in a big, like, two-story warehouse kind of. That's the studio. That's where the, the spaceship La Serena really is. And um, they had a crane, like a, a crane lift at the top, and they said you're going to be jumping down from that on a bunch of ropes uh, for the day. That's what we're going to practice. We're, we're trying to put this stunt into the into the show. Would you be willing to do it? And the first thing I said was, hell, yeah, let's do it. I can <laughs> do this in my sleep. So they attach they put they put a harness on me they attach these ropes i hop onto the, the crane before we go up they go do you want to practice jumping from halfway down first and i go nah i've got this i've got this no problem so we get to the top and immediately i start breaking into a sweat looking down i'm like you know what can we just like lower it can we go back down halfway i think you guys are right well i'm i'm not ready for this but you know the they were very supportive uh you know with all of my stunts uh the stunt team and everyone and, and the director and everything so yeah it was it was the physicality i would say yeah it really did help you know having that sort of trust in the stunt people to take that weight when you take the leap i mean that's that's something it is and um a credit to my stunt double and niece who's also uh the per the the romulan assassin who kills uh Daj. oh wow okay oh is he the, is he the one yeah. who gets vaporized at the uh yeah so he's the one who spits on her um and you know, yeah all that stuff happens and then picard yeah like the explosion happens picard's running so that that was actually him and he he does everything that i couldn't do wouldn't do um he does he's he pretty much makes eleanor look cool he every wall run that you see every really cool like double backflip or anything like that i wish i could take credit for it but it is it's all a niece he's he's a legend and it just makes you realize, I suppose, in this age of high definition and 4K, how seamless that is. Because, I mean, Star Trek has got a, a fine tradition of incredibly obvious stunt performers. So, for example, even going back to the to the 60s show, anytime Captain Kirk would do yeah. something heroic, he'd suddenly transform into a, a middle-aged, <laughs> sort of out of shape <laughs> kind of thing. But that's, uh, that's, that's really come along. Um, but I was just wondering as well, I mean, uh, you, uh, am I correct in thinking that you're, that you're a fan of Star Trek, that you were a fan before you got the role? I'm just curious as to sort of what your history with the franchise was before. So I was a fan of it growing up. My mum is... Uh, big into all things sci-fi so she was kind of the one that uh i guess nurtured that i will admit though growing up initially like whenever we were little and star trek would be playing our mum would come into the room and be like guess what's on and you know being a little kid I'd, I, the thing i the things i'd want to watch would be like ninja turtles or you know the simpsons or something like that and she'd be like star trek's on like let's all go watch and i remember like eye rolling you know at the thought mm -hmm. of going and watching going and watching star trek but the more i you know the more i grew up watching it and the more episodes i watched and the more mum you know would put on the search for spock and uh, i mean even the reboots coming out were you know kind of helped like reignite my love uh for everything star trek so it, it was very uh influential um i'd have to say my favorite episode at the moment i've been sat like before it was measure of a man uh, only because I really, 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 really enjoy enjoy that episode. But I'd have to say I Borg now. I've got a bit of a soft spot for Jonathan Dalarco. Uh, oh, of course, Borg. yes. Yeah, I can't. I, I, every time someone asks me what my favorite episode is now, that is probably without a doubt the number one on my list. It makes me think, actually, because, I mean, you obviously would have been privy to all of the speculation that was happening when the first trailers were coming out for Picard and everything. And I think that the the, the fact that um, Jonathan Del Arco was there was kind of a message almost that the producers were sending to the fans of, hey, you know, this is a somewhat obscure character that we're, we're going to be bringing back. Um, we haven't forgotten. We know. And I think that very much validated the show even before it had aired. So fans, um, what did you make of the speculation? Was it, was it interesting to be in a position of kind of being in on the secret and seeing everybody else scrambling to figure out what it all meant and piecing all of the images together and all of that, that fun some, stuff? Yeah. Some of the theories were very, very out there, you know, like a lot of them touched really close onto, onto what it was and others just were, were nowhere near. So it was, kind of interesting just to see where people's heads were at and what what really what the fans were you know kind of like hoping and expecting for from this star trek and i think we did like uh, i i can say this as a fan i mean it delivered for me uh but i also got to kind of live out uh like a, a dream of mine and that's you know standing next next to jean-luc picard and and you know, standing next to my captain in the world, not as as a person coming on set and visiting, but as an actual character in the show. 
Yeah, and I mean, gosh, what what an what an introduction! What a great sort of mentorship that must have been as well. Um, so, I mean, how could you just take us through the process of you of you of you getting the role? Um, wh- how that occurred? How you found out? Oh, how I found out. So I was originally what happened was I was shooting. Uh, I landed a role in a Blumhouse movie known as Fantasy Island. Mm. Uh, small little role, but very integral to the story. I. We, I was shooting in two kind of, uh, I'd say, periods. I had a three, about a three-week break and where I flew back to Australia. And during that time, I auditioned for Star Trek. Star Trek came, came across um, my audition schedule, I guess, you, if you want to call it, for lack of a better word. And I remember going into the room, meeting the casting director, nervous as hell, so nervous. Uh, we did one take of a scene and I absolutely butchered it. I thought I did a terrible job. He kind of eased me, eased me up. We, I was a bit more relaxed heading into the second take. And then we we smashed out the the two scenes. I said, you know, the, every word verbatim. It, it went how, it, it went as well as I wanted it to go. So I, I left there feeling happy saying, you know, if I got it, I've got it. I, you know, I, I did my best. And then I ended up flying to Fiji the next day to resume filming uh, for Fantasy Island. And I remember the whole flight just... The longer the, the the longer I I, I the, how am I trying to say this? I'm getting tongue tied. The more time that that went by, the worse I thought I did. <laughs> in the audience. you sort of mythologized in your mind what actually happened, perhaps a little. Yeah, I was psyching myself out a lot, and then I get a phone call uh, when I landed in Fiji saying uh, you're actually being considered for the role. You've been shortlisted. Uh, you and I think it was ten other people. They'd like to. They'd like to, uh, you know, have a have a Skype call with you and, and give you some notes, and they'd like you to retape. Uh, two days go by, haven't heard anything from them, and then I get another phone call. The short, the list has been dropped more. Uh, you're being considered one of five. A day goes by, you're now one of three. Uh, the phone call with the director, uh, Hanalee Culpepper, the the lady who, the brilliant, brilliant lady, I should say, uh, who directed uh, the first two episodes of. Picard. Uh, she's doing she some amazing me... work on Discovery as well. Great, yeah, great. She director. has. I, I haven't watched the latest season yet. I'm getting through Lower Decks at the moment. Oh, um, brilliant, brilliant. Which what, a, what a dark horse loving. that show turned out to be. Oh, I, I just had a feeling as well. I'm like, this is something special with uh, Lower Decks. I'm like, this, this is going it, to, it's, it, it reminds me a lot of like uh, Final Space thing and things yeah. like that, but it's got such like a better take. And the humor's there, and and just the throwbacks, and the and the you know just the throwbacks they and the, the homage they pay to all the other shows. Mm. And I, I it, wait, I'm not sure if I'm giving any spoilers, but there's, apparently there's in the last episode uh, there's two people who make an amazing cameo. Yeah, I don't. I don't want to. I don't want to give too much away. In case I, I think. People... I think you'll be fine on this channel. I think. I think we we can be quite confident that all of our all of our viewers will be up to date with. Uh... I can't believe. I can't believe they got Riker and Marina onto the show. It was. Yeah. My sister. My sister rang me and she's like, "You're you're in for uh, you're in for a surprise." Well, I mean, we've had we've had we've had obviously Frakes has been directing the shows uh, yeah. of the, the live action shows, and he's of, of course appeared in in Picard. It's almost as though. He he has to ordain each of the series um, now. He's sort of he's almost replaced William Shatner now as the person that you need. If you want to represent Star Trek with a person, Frakes is a good person to to do that. And a Marina as well. I mean, some of the work that Marina did in in uh, in Picard was um, was heartbreaking. Yeah, re- re- I wish when Issa texted us, uh, they were because they all were on the set that day. Michael Dawn, uh, I was so jealous. I was like, you need to get pictures. You need to get pictures of all the group together, all of them chatting just, and the photos that she sent through, it was, it, it looked like a reunion of just old friends. You yeah. Know, or just, the, the world's most excitement. exclusive convention. Yeah. The, 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 yeah. the fire fest that went well of conventions in, uh, <laughs> in many A fire fest that was shooting at, at a Paramount, like lot, I think it was like lot 16. <laughs> Wow. Most exclusive thing, yeah. Yeah, but anyway, sorry, I derailed you. You were telling me about, about how you were. You the, the numbers were getting whittled down, and there was this process. The, yes, so the numbers were getting whittled down. I spoke to Hanalee over the phone. She gave me her notes. I the night before we were filming an underwater scene in Fantasy Island, I had caught like a really bad chest infection of some sort. So my throat and my nose were really clogged. So I was, you know, sniffing the the nose clearer. I had a 
I think it was a bath towel as my background in my hotel room. And we were shooting on my really old MacBook and everything just looked pixelated, but it was the best we could do. So I, I sent, I, I taped that, sent it through and then three days go by, don't hear anything. And then I wrap, I finish, I finish filming my scenes and I get back to my uh, hotel room at six in the morning. Sun's, the sun's rising. I'm dead. I'm half asleep. And I get a phone call saying from my manager saying, you've got Star Trek. And at this point, I'm so tired. I'm just like, yep. Okay. That's great news. Cool. Good night. Bye. Wow. They must be like, wow, he's a cool customer. This, this, this cat. Like, yeah. They'd be like, he, he, he gives nothing away. But then I woke up the, the next morning being like, did that happen? Or was that a dream? So I had to kind of call and just to confirm, I'm like, so I got, I got that role. Yeah. And then we spoke some more yet. Yeah, you got the role. You'll be going to LA in a couple months time. We're just prepping the visa and everything. And then I kind of just went nuts and like, like lost my mind. I called, I called home. I called my mom. I called every, and I couldn't tell anyone what I was auditioning for as well. So I, cause I knew like my family would, would love it. Like the, the you know, this is kind of like a dream. If one of us is in the show, you know, it's. That, and know. talk about a validating thing for families as well. I mean, you know, everybody knows what Star Trek is. I mean, that's not something that you need to explain or contextualize to somebody. That's 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 big. Yeah, it was kind of the same with Fantasy Island too, but because uh, it was a uh, a dark reboot of the the old TV. Yeah, show. yeah, that that Bloomhouse Fantasy Island film is it, that is an interesting film. That's a that's a novel way to approach a, a, a reboot of a of a beloved television franchise. Yeah, it was very interesting because I remember when I first auditioned for that, I was thinking, oh, J like Jumanji, like this yeah. HSB Jumanji. And then I started reading. I'm like, oh, it's actually like a little bit a lot darker than yeah. than, yeah, than Jumanji. It, it, it was an interesting take. Film. Yeah, and, and Khan as well, Ricardo Montalban. So I feel like I've just jumped from one friend, one thing that he was in into another thing that he was in. Wow, yeah. Hey, you know what? And he was in a couple of the Planet of the Apes movies as well. So there's another franchise that you're going to have to transition into now in some capacity. Yeah. Fingers crossed. Well, I wouldn't mind playing an ape. Maybe, I don't well, I don't know what, what they're doing with that, but that'd be cool. I, I'd, I'd love to try and yeah. the green suit and... A bit of mocap. You know. You know, yeah, exactly. Spend a bit of time in Wellington at the uh, Peter Jackson's place. That wouldn't be too bad. So, so what about that? What about your first meeting with uh, with Sir Patrick? I'd imagine that would be a, a pretty uh, a pretty bracing experience. Pretty nerve wracking. Pretty embarrassing as well. Uh, they brought me through to set, and he was filming that interview scene where he's discussing the attack on Mars and 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 what what went wrong with the Federation. And they, they call for a break. The producers go over, they grab him, they bring him over. And the first thing he says is, hi, I'm Patrick, in his very, you know, ca calming voice. Uh, puts his hand out, I shake his hand, and I say, good, thanks. Like, I don't say, hi, my name is Evan. I don't say, hi, how are you? I just say, good, thanks. And that's kind of stuck with me. Uh, for a very, very, very long. Like, did I'm he comment, or I, did he just did he just power through and? Uh... He played it off. He powered it through. He's you know he's a professional. He's a professional at meeting people. He probably gets it all the time at conventions. I, I imagine there'd be a lot of people who were tongue tied when meeting Sir Patrick Stewart. So I was probably just like one of many. I'm probably one of many as well that you know work across from him and and get tongue tied or work across from him and just are amazed at uh, you know his acting ability and not not just his acting ability actually just who he is as a person um you know you there you hear about great actors who are, who are fantastic actors but terrible people but patrick is everything he's a he's he's a caring person supportive wants to know your opinion and your thoughts on things as well especially like on set and he doesn't need to do that either I, I, he just does it out of the kindness of his heart because he's such a good person so a couple of other people that you work with very closely on the show, I was just curious to get a sense of, of your sort of relationship and dynamic with them. Uh, first of all, obviously, you did a lot of stuff with with Jerry Ryan as well. So really, you, you got to do, have quite close ties with two very iconic actors in very, very iconic roles. What, what were your experiences working with, with, with Jerry Ryan? I'd imagine also being, you know, being a Star Trek fan, having a family as well. That must have been a, a very sort of uh, similar experience to, to meeting and working with Patrick, I'd imagine. Well, I think it was my brother's, uh, one of his crushes growing up. I remember him talking, saying, you know, like, oh, he loves Jerry Ryan. Um, so that was very interesting. But the, I'd say the difference uh, between Jerry and, and Patrick, both of them uh, the utmost pro professionals, but I spent a, a little bit more time 
uh, with just with Jerry, where it was more as I was getting to know Patrick, I was getting to know everyone else. But uh, getting to know Jerry, I was just able to just it, it was just her and I uh, in a lot of the scenes. And, and we had so much fun. There were a lot of uh, a few late nights where we couldn't get our words out because we just break character so much. Like we, there were a few times where it'd be like the last take and uh, you know, the camera would be facing Jerry or the camera would be facing me. And the the person who, who, whose back was facing the camera would just be laughing and smiling. So yeah, it was just all just laughs. Was, sabotaging was, the other person whilst they were. <laughs> yeah. Almost. The more we got in, into filming and the more we all filmed together, the friendlier we all became, the more relaxed, uh, we all became around each other, and I think that kind of shows throughout the progression of the of the series. And it's kind of interesting. I mean, here in in Picard season one, this these group of strangers are are getting assembled, and they are are actually like some of them have history, but a lot of them are meeting each other for the first time and are trying to kind of figure out their dynamic within within the crew. And that was very much what was happening behind the scenes as well we were all you know getting to know each other and, and figuring out uh, each other's dynamics and how how we all work together and it, it was kind of, it's kind of like a it's it's weird when re reality mirrors uh fiction and i suppose also when you've got a lead who's playing you know a uh, an authority figure a captain although not necessarily so in in picard as well le leading a cast and i'm just wondering as well i mean wh as far as where, where you are in, in in your career at the moment as well is i think one of the things that's interesting that viewers and listeners may or may not know about picard is the way that it was shot in blocks of of two episodes with directors yep. so I, i'd imagine it was a great experience from you to essentially i mean making five movies you know having these these blocks so i'm just wondering what lessons you learn from the 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 diversity of of, of filmmakers both li literally diverse but also just the fact the fact that different points in their, their career and backgrounds and also i was just wondering if you could tell us a little bit about working with jonathan frakes as as a director as well if you could just speak to those experiences so uh it's pretty much the well of the first thing i'll say about jonathan frakes uh i couldn't have picked a better director to have done my first episode in in star trek with because of course Sydney, he directed absolute candor didn't he yeah and he knows trek back to front on screen and off screen so he knows what works he knows what doesn't he's very particular um and even though he's got such like a loud booming voice it's never like a he never spoke in a way that w would make me feel uncomfortable or uncertain it was always very like supportive and nurturing so jonathan if you're listening to this thank you again i always thank him whenever i see him and um yeah i love jonathan uh to death in terms of the the block shooting and every and uh the differences every day was a learning experience for me what i a lot of things that i did learn on on set is things go wrong uh they can go wrong and a lot of the times they will go wrong but there's normally always a way to, there's normally always a solution to solve it. Uh, so a lot of the times it's people, you know, solving problems or working things out or working around things. Uh, each filmmaker that came on set, every single person, as you said, is on a different, in a different point of their career and, you know, doing different things. Everyone works a different way. Every director, not every director is the same. So, you know, you'll, you'll have someone that's really focused on, the action or the camera work and then other times you'll have someone that's really focused on the on, on nurturing and helping the actors and directing the actors so it was a really good learning experience to just make me realize that no set's the same uh even when we we were shooting trek you know uh the the first the, the first block uh, of filming is different to the third block just as much as the second block and and, and like so on and so forth but yeah, it, I'd say it was almost like a crash course that you that money couldn't the best crash course you could ever get uh, that money couldn't buy. Yeah, wow. I mean, I suppose. I mean, his, his Star Trek has a great as a franchise has a great history for being an, a, a talent academy in many ways and nurturing people from acting into directing. And uh, you know, Frakes himself obviously is a great example of that. But also, you know, everyone from Lavar Burton through Patrick Stewart. Um, and, I, and I'm just wondering as well. I mean, um, as far as this process and the the infrastructure, I suppose that you found yourself in. Um, 
I just want to sort of relate that a little bit to specifically to the character of Elnor, um, because I think that, that I mean, Elnor's a lot of his defining qualities are dichotomous, are, are around the fact that he's a very physically strong and capable character, but he's extremely an extremely emotional character as well. And in, in many ways, I think he's kind of the heart of the show, I think it's fair to say. And he's also quite sheltered as well. I'm just wondering how you would characterize Elnor and what the process of discovery was for you with the character collaborating with directors, etc. Well, I mean, in terms of creating the character, I have to give credit to Michael Shaven uh, and, and the writing team. They, you know, gave me the bare bones, well, not even the bare bones, they gave me a very great character to be able to work with. And then, uh, you know, they, gi they give me the script, I interpret it, and I, I give my rendition of the character and, and my interpretation of it. And it's clearly something that um, people are receptive to because uh, uh, I've, I've got nothing but good feedback so far, which, which I'm happy with. There's probably like a lot of negative feedback uh, out there, but that, that comes with any franchise that you enter. There's always going to be people who are divided either on a series or a character or, or you know. The fact you that it's it. not exactly the same as the one they grew up on is, is the yeah, big one, exactly. I suppose. And it is a little different, you know, seeing someone who looks like an elf, a space elf, uh, you know, like on, in, in the middle of space fighting with the sword and, and things like that. But uh tackling the character it, it was kind of hard to portray i really had to go back and think how would a kid who's you know being being taken to their first day of school what mm. what is that like for them you're meeting new people you're learning new things and you don't quite have a grasp of everything but everything is also exciting and terrifying at the same time so i kind of had to enter those things enter with that kind of mind frame whenever whenever I was, you know, reading the script or, or, or rehearsing and trying to, you know, break, break down my character and, and run down the, the scenes. But that being said, he's also very physically capable. He's, uh, he's an assassin who can, you know, kill someone with his bare hands and with his, you know, sword and staff. So it's, it's, it's a fine line, I think. Uh, and I think the, the humour comes out by playing it straight with him and it bring, that's the only way to really bring out uh, his innocence. I feel, I feel as though if I had played uh, for comedy or if I had pushed it a little bit more, it just wouldn't have come off as uh, genuine. Mm. It would have come off as almost forced. I did like what you said about Eleanor being the heart of the show. I would actually kindly disagree and say that he is almost the person that points out the obvious that isn't noticed. Mm. Uh, and he's able to speak his his mind at points where other people aren't. So he he's he, he is almost like the voice of not not reason, but uh, I don't know how to say I don't know how to say, make this sound sound articulate. But he just pretty much points out the things that people are are either not willing to see or just are, are you know so preoccupied that they that they miss it. And that's an important function, I think, in any Star Trek show. I mean, you've always had characters. Uh, for example, um, you know, like whether it be Spock in the original series or perhaps Worf or Data in the next generation who kind of just don't have the capacity to bullshit, basically, and are very kind of there for, for no, those moments of levity. And I think another thing about Elnor as well that's interesting is that it's how the other characters respond around him that kind of defines him and in some ways defines the show like i mean i noticed the episode where um there's an episode that that, that opens with um uh, santiago uh, cabrera's character talking about how you know you've just been left on on the, the borg ship and there's always concern and that is a moment where the group really congeals in their sort of concern for you as well and i'm just wondering what what you feel are the defining moments for Elnor? Are there any moments in this series that you can point to either just that you enjoyed watching as, I suppose, having that, that distance after the show had been edited and watching it as an, an audience member, but also being the person who has, has obviously contributed to bringing Elnor to life. Um, any moments that you feel were really sort of central or enjoyable um, for the character? Uh, for the character, I'd say there's a few, I'd say there's a few unenjoyable moments. Uh, which is probably moments that are enjoyable for the for the viewer. So oh, really? an unenjoyable moment, an, an unenjoyable moment for Elnor, I'd say, would have to be when he beheaded his beheading scene. So I mean, that's really the first time he's actually killed someone. Uh, 
in 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 like well obviously in the in track it's the yeah. first it's the first person he's killed it's someone that he's grown up uh grown up knowing you know his entire life and he gave that person the option so i think there is his first kind of understanding of of what death actually is uh i'd say another moment that's pretty that that would stand out for Eleanor is obviously any any time on the Borg Borg cube, uh, especially when Jonathan uh, Delarco or Hugh, especially when Hugh dies, and then you know teaming up with uh, Seven of Nine and and taking back the cube. I'd have to say that was kind of like his his moment because he he's essentially com- uh, completed you know one of his impossible missions. He's he's helped free the Borg the Borgs of, uh, you know, Romulan control. So I'd have to say that kind of stands out for, for Elnor. And a scene that really stood out for me is that is when we're on Capellius and uh, the crew come to the cube and they're not sure what they're going to find there. That, that, that really stood out to me, that kind of like reuniting mm. moment. That, that, that was a fun scene to film. They cut it out, but I actually sprint over, hug everyone, and I pick up Alison Pill. <laughs> and, like, spin her around so I don't, and i don't think she was expecting that either but that was like a real fun kind of moment oh she, it's like, such a shame that wasn't left in yeah i mean the things make you know not every if, if we could put everything in you know we would but that's hey. just not the way it works season two uh i don't think it's interesting as well but i think that that um elnor brings out a lot of the protect protective impulses of the audience as well like when i was watching this my wife's a star trek fan as well not as not as not as much as i she's she humors me but uh but she does enjoy <laughs> she really enjoys picard but when um there's a sort of empathy i think that elnor brings out because the moment when you get left on the board cube my wife and the episode ends with it just just literally stood up and went he better be okay <laughs> and it was just to see that kind of level of concern over a new character i thought was uh was was really interesting but um and what, tell me a little bit about the sort of I, I i understand that you you have um you know an interest in um in fashion and obviously you know fashion and costuming in their own way are, are a big element for elnor what was that like can you tell me a little bit about your sort of um was that interesting and enjoyable for you or was it a was it a difficult thing to do and it was um so i i before i started acting or or really started pursuing acting i i was scouted for modeling so for the past i don't know like three years before star trek that was kind of my 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 work my life so into fashion heading towards costume and just seeing the concepts of everything before i actually headed in was so exciting and then you go in and they, they literally measure you head to toe, uh, you know, hand width, um, arm width, everything, you know, circumference. And they cust- they, they build this, this like amazing outfit from just an idea. It, it's, it, that's, that's the whole part. That's the thing about, actually, that's the thing about everything creative that kind of amazes me. You know, it just starts with an idea, a small little seed, and it's kind of up to the person to, you know, nurture it and, help it grow into whatever it is. And um, yeah, credit to Christine, head of uh, head of costume and, and design. She she made me the most badass out- outfit I think I've ever I've ever worn. It was it was warm, you know, during all the action scenes, but uh, you know, I wouldn't have chosen a different outfit because I don't know, I, d- I feel like it just worked with Elnor. I suppose one of the other defining elements of Elnor is that you've got You've got a catchphrase. That's a rare thing for for start. You know, for 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 a, a, a new character. And um, was that? I mean, presumably that was there from the beginning. Was that just something that you saw in the script and thought, "Oh, that's badass that I, I'm gonna I'm gonna get this." And you get to say it several times, so it gets solidified in the minds of the viewers as well. And in um, and I get to say it in Romulan as well, uh, which yeah. which made me really happy. But w- when I first got that, that was so that was in the the first script I ever got uh, for Elnor. So that's that's been in there, I think, since since the beginning. But as soon as I read it, I was like, "Please, my friend, you still this?" I'm like, "Oh, I'm like, is this going to be a catchphrase?" That's that was my first thing. And then the more I said it, you know, like like we're talking, Arnie has hasta la vista, baby, or I'll be back, Elnor or me. I've got, please, my friend, choose to live, and I love it. Uh, every the, the convention that I that I do, or whenever I'm on cameo, that's pretty much the like my go-to thing you know please my friend choose to have a happy birthday so i think it's stuck 
Um, and also, what a, what a great catchphrase because you get to be polite and badass all at the same time. So it really yeah. kind of ticks all the ticks all, all the boxes. And also, how many people get to say that they have had their catchphrase written by a Pulitzer Prize winning author? I mean, that's I, a good spot. Not many. If if there are, if, I hope I am just the one though. Yeah, I think a, I think that's a that's a club of one, isn't it? Um, yeah. What was the response of your friends with, with all of this? I mean, because this is a life changing thing for you. But, but how have your how have your friends responded to this? Do they uh, act differently around you? Were they impressed, or were they just like, yeah, nah, whatever, you know? Um, yes and no. Like uh, the the interesting thing was, I found out a lot more of my friends like Star Trek than I thought. So well, people were coming out of the closet on that, were they? Or yeah, so that that was the interesting thing because I I feel like still. I'm, I'm openly a Star Trek fan, but a lot of my friends were like, you know, like I, I grew up watching Star Trek or, you know, Deep Space Nine. My parents always, you know, had it on the sci-fi channel and things like that. But for the most part, all of them are, you know, f fairly normal. I mean, they'll try and talk to me about my episodes or, or things like that. And I don't really, that's, that's normally when I don't, that's, I get uncomfortable with that actually. <laughs> If, if I'm being honest, I normally say, you know, like, let's not talk about, let's not talk, like, let's talk about, like, you know, the footy or let's talk about, you know, Star Trek Discovery or the the new movie that everyone, like the new script, like the supposed uh, Star Trek script that uh, Quentin Tarantino's mm. written, like, what do you reckon that would be like? Yeah, like, I'll speculate know. with you, but I'm not going to, it's, uh, I, I mean, I suppose it's all, uh, many jobs have confidentiality clauses. It's not, this isn't exclusively a showbiz thing, I guess. I, I don't think it is, but, you know, to their credit, they, yeah, they, they do treat me just like, uh, like nothing's changed, which is nice. You know, How it's, much it's, you it's, just wait, sorry, in this, me? this sort of confidentiality space, how much information did you have? about the show when you were filming it did you just have your sides or did you have how much did you know um just trying to think about how much more that so i knew everything i knew a lot about my character in terms of background everything like that um storyline they give us a rough kind of understanding of, of what's going on and where it's leading but a lot of the times you know with uh, like when jerry ryan appeared in in uh in at the end of my episode uh i wasn't told about that i was i was told before i was given the script you know this is this is going to be your introduction uh episode it's going to give you be given there's going to be a bit of background about your character revealed and your history with uh picard and then there's going to be you know somewhat of a surprise at the end and i remember thinking what what is the surprise and i remember reading someone i remember literally the week before someone dm'd me like ran a, a trek fan and, and asked if i'm going to be uh picard's long lost uh romulan son and i just remember thinking like where have they where have they uh connected the two like how have they found that connection and i think it is i think it's literally just because i'm australian and he's english and people are like oh you know, England colonized Australia. It's, <laughs> there, mu there must be, that must be the connection. But as soon as I read uh, Seven of Nine, I was just like blown away. So a, a lot of the surprises and um, a kind of reveals were, were only revealed once we were given the script for the show. Sure. Was there any conversation about your accent? Was there any ever talk of you playing it British or playing it American or? So I was, I did, I auditioned for the role uh, with an American accent and we got all the way up to rehearsals with the accent, but credit to John Frakes, he approached the, uh, the producers and everything. He said, we've an English uh, Romulan, we've got a Romulan with a Nigerian accent. We've got Romulans with all different accents. This is a, 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 a person who has been displaced from his home. Mm. Why don't we, you know, get a bit more, get create a bit more in inclusivity and uh, diversity, and why don't we let him use his natural accent? So they spoke to me about it. They they said, you know, is that something you know you'd be comfortable with doing? Not because apparently not every actor is comfortable with speaking in mm. their in in their regular accent. I know Tom Holland as an example is someone mm. who doesn't really like acting with it, using his British accent. He prefers using uh, American, but I, I was all for it. And I think it was a really good choice. I think it, it kind of gives a broader understanding of, of 
and not just Romulans, but kind of like any species, you know, they're going to have any accent. It's not just uh, going to be standard British or, or American, you know, there's going to be diversity and people mm. are going to sound different. I mean, people sound different and we're all on the same planet. Sure. So how yeah. different are, are people who are raised in, you know, Alpha Centauri, for example, going to sound compared to us? Like it's going to be different. So it, it, it is funny what sometimes people question in science fiction as well. And, and we have come a long way, fortunately, and not all the way there. I mean, I remember in the mid 90s when um, Tim Russ was revealed as playing a Vulcan character in Star Trek Voyager. And um, people's responses initially, fortunately, a very small number of people was there aren't African-American Vulcans. And it's like you, you, you'll accept Vulcans, but you'll only accept that there are only Caucasian. Yeah. <laughs> and I mean, I mean, now that seems kind of ridiculous, you know, or co comic almost. But uh, but I think now, and obviously, you know, we've had um, an Irish Romulan as well in the series yeah. as well. So I think it's good that that's just not something that's even being questioned anymore. Yeah, or even really like uh, spoken about or addressed. You know, oh, why does he sound? Why does he sound different? Why does he? I, I think. When you're the first of something in a show, there's always going to be kind of, well, like we said, there's always going to be division. People are always going to speak up about it because it's not aligning with their ideas. But the great thing about Star Trek is it's always been diverse and inclusive and different. And they have always pushed, you know, boundaries and done things that are different. Like people are, was it, is it Deep Space Nine? You can't, people always were saying like, you can't have Star Trek if it's, on a, if it's mm. centered in one spot i mean you can it's a very obvious you can because mm. look at deep space nine and look at the success of it and how much of a great show how many people love that show it just, and i think with picard it'll, it's the same i think that i mean i'm really that's one of the reasons why i'm really looking forward to season two is that for a lot of kind of um the old school fans it always takes a season to sort of settle in and then yeah. sort of return to i mean the obviously season one ends with you guys very much a crew so it's almost as though season one is is the prologue, and that's of discovery did did a very similar thing. So I mean, on on that subject, um, season two that's the elephant in the room. When 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 the, when's the film going to start rolling? Uh soon, very 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 soon. Uh, I not I don't know if I'm allowed to say exactly when. Uh, not before Christmas, I think I'm allowed to say that. I think we all know it's starting in January. Yes, yeah, sweet. Okay, yeah. <laughs> I have been watching. I am on a lot of the. Uh, facebook groups like star trek shit posting and oh yeah uh, yeah i love to the more the, irreverent the better i think with the star trek groups is my uh... yeah so yeah january we will be we will be filming uh i don't even know if i can i don't know if they posted the date all i know is everyone's just saying january 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 yeah. uh so we'll, we'll start season two there and in my opinion it cannot quicker i'm so excited not just to get back to work but to get back to you know the motley crew and and hang out with everyone and you know just in the not even not even sure i'm allowed to say where we're filming but uh, at some random studio in california That's yeah and I, I think that because you've all had this as we all have had this incredible experience over the last year i think that will be sort of really adds for determination and i suppose one other thing as well when, when you, that you will i'm sure you already understand on an intellectual level but well i think we'll really hit home when you do start getting out to those those conventions is that Star Trek is, has always had a little bit more to it, I think, from a fan perspective, because of a lot of the, um, the, the, the sort of the mythology of Gene Roddenberry, and um, the, um, the message of, of that. I'm just wondering what what does Star Trek mean to you as a philosophy? It's very interesting. I remember being asked this uh, earlier in the year. What does Star Trek mean to me? Before, before I'd say it was just entertainment. Growing up, it was something I could watch. And then, the more the actually going back to it as well, just kind of like made me realize more and more how much of a mirror it is to our society, um, and how much it does reflect. And I, I, the great thing about sci-fi, and the great the great thing about gene and how he portrayed all these messages I'd ha i have to say they were like easily digestible if that makes sense it didn't feel in your face it didn't feel forced and i feel like the writers now are continuing that legacy they're bringing up real world issues today issues problems that we're going to be facing in the future and problems that we're facing today and they're bringing light to it and helping you know create a dialogue uh you know amongst people and 
credit to you know trekkies and trekkers everywhere they were the first people to kind of like pick up on that and what are your hopes for season two for for elnor and, and from the show have you got anything that you'd like to see in season two or beyond or any um actors that you'd like to perhaps get to spend a little bit more time with on screen i'd like to see sir ian in the show um i'd like to it's see gotta Jody happen it's gotta happen at it's some point happen. hasn't it whether it's a villain or another com- like a commander or something you know he needs to be and i'd like to see geordie i'd love a sparring session with Worf. something you know just a yeah you guys of just sort of you're the same but different aren't you yeah i mean it was uh klingons that were viewed as you know enemies and then you know we we get given Worf, and that's a different perspective on on uh klingons you know not everyone's uh you know not everyone's the same and i think it's the same with elnor uh you know it's a different view on romulans that we haven't seen before a different portrayal and he's so different to you know what most romulans are most romulans are very secretive and you know not trusting and scheming or that's how they're viewed anyway and then you've got this kid this romulan what do they call it what do they what were they calling him the she boy or the boy sister sister boy and he's completely different. He speaks his mind. He, you know, believes in protecting and helping people and, you know, doing his utmost to protect everyone. Yeah, well, I mean, I'm, I'm definitely looking forward to season two. And I think that Elnor will be a really key figure because I think that all Star Trek shows have that character who looks at humanity with uh, an, a, a sort of objective lens in a way that the other characters yeah. can't. So I think that there'll always be a lot for um, for Elnor to do. So uh, all that remains to be said is thank you so much for your time, Evan. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thanks, Mike. It's been an absolute pleasure too. Thank you. And um, can't wait to um, start seeing the, um, the the insane rumors for season two um, coming up. The first time you guys have an opportunity to throw us any scraps, uh, we'll be all pouring over those and trying to figure out um, who your father or son is uh, and all that good yeah. stuff. <laughs> son, oh, oh, oh no, what's it, what's been going on between season one and two? Well, you know, so we've all been locked locked down, haven't we? You've got to keep yourself amused somehow. These things happen. There, there are a Let's... lot of uh, lockdown babies, uh, uh, lockdown pregnancies, I reckon, that are going to be uh, appearing very soon. Well, yeah, that's it. There's going to be a whole uh, a whole sort of generation of people who are going to look back on when they were born and do the maths and go, hang on. <laughs> I think I can see what's going on here, but uh, but no, thank thank you so much for your time. And um, I'm just wondering, is there is there anything that you, have you got any online presence or anything that you'd like to sort of push people towards, or how they can I mean, find out about you or learn more about you and your work? I'm I'm really just on Instagram. Um, I do want to say to everyone though, um, please download the free Rice app. So what this game is is essentially you. It's a quiz game. And uh, there are ad banners underneath. This is run by the, it's a game that's run by the Worldwide Food Program. And it's uh, also run by the UN as well. So under the UN, uh, for every an- question you answer, five grains of rice uh, will get the, equi- like the equivalent of money. It, it, equi- it adds up to being five grains of rice. And, you know, you can answer like 200 questions in a day. And the more people that do it, the more money gets donated, the more oh, awesome. that we can help end you know, like famine in Yemen and, and, you know, famine around the world. That's brilliant. And I'll add a link to that in the show notes. If you guys uh, just look on the YouTube page or just look down at your phone and there'll be a link that you can click on and uh, do that. So again, thanks so much for your time. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thanks, Mike. Have a good one. Live long and prosper.